Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another in our series of online programs. My name is Patrice Weaver, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust. The Commission is a secular, nonpartisan state agency that strives to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and promote public understanding of the history. We're going to continue our series of the longest hatred, historic anti-Semitism, with part three. And today we're going to cover the period between the early 19th century to the rise of National Socialism. We're going to start off today with the topic of economic anti-Semitism or when finance became a code word for Jewish. The idea that Jews were innately good with money is among the oldest Jewish stereotypes one that continues to impact perceptions of Jews today. As with many stereotypes, this one has its origins in fact. Jews have long been well represented in the fields of finance and business. This is commonly attributed to the fact that for centuries, Jews were excluded from professional guilds and denied the right to own land, forcing them to work as merchants and financiers. Now some academics contend that the historical evidence does not support this thesis and that Jewish financial success is instead due to, due to the community's high literacy rates. Whatever the cause, Jewish business and financial success has more often than not been a major driver of anti-Semitism. You will, you will recall that last week we looked briefly at the Elizabethan character of Shylock from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Shylock was a moneylender and is among history's best known caricatures of the Jewish businessmen. This caricature lent a sinister undertone of greed and exploitation to Jewish financial dealings that would be invoked to justify anti-Jewish measures for centuries to come. So let's look at these pictures in this slide. I've taken these images, these caricatures of Jewish financiers from the 19th, early, early, 20th century and late 19th century. There's one from France, there's one from Germany, and there's a cartoon from America that was in a book called, or a magazine called Judge in 1892, showing a Jewish immigrant's story, supposedly. So you can see, if you look at it closely, you see that he starts in Russia, he climbs with a pack on his back, he arrives in New York, which they've renamed here New Jerusalem, uh, if you notice, all of the titles of the companies, the businesses, all have Jewish names. And then he heads out west to continue his domination of the financial world. So again, you know, we were looking at that Elizabethan character of Shylock. Now we're going to look at a Victorian era character. Charles Dickens' novel, The Oliver Twist, is set in London and features a crafty character named Fagin, who teaches homeless boys how to be pickpockets and then fences their stolen goods. He is depicted as an avarice miser and exploiter. The, the Encyclopedia Britannica calls Fagin one of the most notorious anti-Semitic portraits in English literature. When we first meet Fagin in the novel, he is described as a very old, shriveled Jew, whose villainous looking and repulsive face is obscured by a quantity of matted red hair. Now that red hair is a tip of the hat to the medieval mystery plays that always depicted the devil as having red hair. At the novel's end, at the novel's end Fagin gets his just rewards and is executed for complicity in a murder. So was Dickens anti-Semitic? Dickens claims that he held Jews in high regard and that the depiction of Fagin was simply a caricature that was based on actual persons. Be that as it may, in 1860, when Dickens put his house up for sale, it was bought by a banker whom Dickens described to a friend as a Jew moneylender. Now, during his own time, Dickens was soundly criticized for his stereotypical depiction of Fagin. In an apparent demonstration of remorse, he removed many occurrences of the word Jew from later editions of the work. However, there are plenty more contained in it to this day, and Oliver Twist, the novel, has never been out of print. So now I want to show you some representations of contemporary times of this character, Fagin. Now these are some famous depictions of Fagin in movies played by Alec Guinness, Ron Moody, and Ben Kingsley. You're probably most familiar with the one of Ron Moody. In 1968, he was Fagin in the movie 
musical Oliver, which was based on the novel Oliver Twist. Now, just looking at those, you can see the similarities. They all have these prosthetic noses that accentuate their features. They have this ratty, matted hair, and they're dressed shabbily. And, and take a look at how Alec Guinness is, is looking longingly at that jewelry. You can draw your own conclusions of how anti-Semitic these depictions are. So now we're going to turn our attention to a little more intellectual history. And a guy named Louis Gabriel Ambrose, the Vicomte de Bonald. Uh, de Bonald was a prominent French counter-revolutionary and political philosopher. De Bonald was an enemy of Napoleon Bonaparte, and amongst his many dislikes of the emperor's policies was Napoleon's extension of equality to all Frenchmen, including Jews. A strident Roman Catholic, de Bonald hated Jews so much that he risked his life by speaking against the newfound rights, their newfound rights during Napoleon's rule. In 1806, he wrote an article entitled Sur la Juifs on the Jews, which argued that Jews were violently immoral parasites against whom good Frenchmen need to be protected. He demanded the reissue of the Jewish law of the laws that required Jews to wear special identifying badges. Most disturbingly of all, de Bonald invented several facets of today's anti-Semitism. He stressed their racial differences to quote unquote normal people, criticized their financial dealings, and also claimed that they fostered plans to take over the world through Jewish financial feudalism. Furthermore, he advocated keeping Jewish people entirely separate from the rest of society because, and I quote here, the Jews cannot and never will be, no matter what is said, citizens under Christianity unless they become Christians, end quote. De Bonald held several influential offices under Napoleon, after Napoleon's downfall, and his anti-Semitic ideas can be traced through most subsequent anti-Jewish literature and thought. Some of his books are still in print and available from Amazon and other outlets if you want to take a look for yourself. So I'm going to move from financial anti-Semitism and look at something called the Damas Damascus Affair, which had a real connection to France and its intellectual positions at the time about anti-Semitism. So in 1840, anti-Semitism reared its head in Syria with a little nudge from some Christian Frenchmen. That year in Damascus, a Capuchin monk, Thomas, and his Muslim servant, Ibrahim, disappeared. The Capuchin order spread rumors that the city's Jews were responsible, and the French consul won support from the Islamic governor of Syria to launch his investigation. Some bones were found in a French quarter sewer, and investigators refused requests to send these bones for scientific, scientific examination. They concluded they simply had to belong to Thomas and Ibrahim. So in true medieval fashion, the Damascus authorities arrested a Jew at random and tortured him until he confessed a blood libel had taken place and incriminated prominent members of the Jewish community. Thirteen people were arrested and four of them died under torture. The remainder were released after the governor's superior, the Pasha of Egypt, bowed to international pressure and launched an independent investigation. Unfortunately, by the time the Damascus, by that time, the Damascus synagogue had been pillaged and its scrolls of the law burned. Now news of the alleged blood libel led to widespread violence against Jews in the Arab world over the coming decades. So now we're gonna leave Syria and go back to Europe for a minute and look at this racial science that started to really come into its own during the 19th century. So in the late 19th century, there was a shift from the perceived errors of Jewish religious practices and their guilt of deicide to genetic characteristics. What came to be known as racial science was a preposterous so-called scientific school of thought that taught that Semitic people would never be able to assimilate with Aryan and Indo-European societies because of their hereditary nature. This nature was characterized as lazy, greedy, gifted in finance, and insular. This meant that Jews were a threat to Western civilization itself through intermarriage and interracial sex. So first of all, Jews aren't a race at all. They're an ethno-religious group. 
The lack of scientific basis for these racial science theories meant that anyone could publish on the topic. All you needed was a thoroughly racist outlook. So along comes Willem Marr, a German political agitator with no scientific training. Marr published a book, and the English title is The Victory of the Jewish Spirit Over the German Spirit in 1879. Actually, this is the first time the term anti-Semitism was used. Now, this erroneous racial science formed the basis for Nazi eugenics and eventual genocide. So if you want to check this book out for yourself, it's available in English from Amazon. Also in this slide, you see a picture depicting phrenology. Now, phrenology was another one of these pseudosciences that came into vogue in the late 19th century. And this spread from Europe to the United States and was widely purported to be a key to unlocking a person's intellectual and emotional maturity and their abilities, which, you know, it's just a crock, every bit of it. So now we're going to turn to something that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, the Dreyfus Affair in France. Now, Dreyfus was Alfred Dreyfus was an artillery captain in the French army and he was the only Jew on the French general staff and in 1894 he was convicted of passing military secrets to the Germans so it turns out there was a French spy at the German embassy in Paris who discovered a ripped up letter in a wastebasket with handwriting said to resemble that of Dreyfus and during his trial a mob outside the courtroom chanted death to the Jews and other anti-semitic slogans Dreyfus was court-martialed, found guilty of treason, and sentenced to life behind bars in the notorious hellhole prison of Devil's Island. Following his conviction, Dreyfus was publicly degraded in the courtyard of the École Militaire. Before a screaming crowd, his insignia were torn from his uniform, his medals stripped from him, and his sword bro broken. He was then paraded around the grounds in his ruined uniform as the crowd spat at him and shouted, Death to Judas! death to the Jew. In 1896, the new head of the Army's intelligence unit, one Georges Picard, uncovered evidence pointing to another French military officer as the real traitor. However, when Picard told his bosses what he discovered, he was discouraged from continuing his investigation, transferred to North Africa, and later imprisoned on trumped-up charges. Nevertheless, Word about the other man's possible guilt began to circulate. And in 1898, that man was court-martialed, but quickly found not guilty. He later fled the country, so you can draw your own conclusions there. After his acquittal, a French newspaper published an open letter written by well-known author Emile Zola to the president of France titled, J'accuse, or I accuse. In the letter, Zola defended Dreyfus and accused the military of a major cover-up in the case. The letter's publication triggered anti-Semitic riots all over the French Empire. In 1899, Dreyfus was court-martialed for a second time and again quickly found guilty. Although he was pardoned days later by the French president, it wasn't until 1906 that Dreyfus officially was exonerated and reinstated in the army. He went on to serve honorably throughout World War I in frontline positions. So what was the impact of the Dreyfus Affair on France? Over 10 years, it deeply divided France, not just over the fate of the man in its center, but also over a range of issues, including politics, national identity, and anti-Semitism. It amplified the political battle that was going on between the left and the right. Most importantly, it destroyed all hopes for the monarchists and militarists who longed for a restoration of the monarchy. Overall, the Dreyfus Affair helped the Republic reassert its power over the army and reinforce the separation of church and state. Unfortunately, it also awoke the pervasive, if somewhat latent, anti-Semitism of the French people. So as a side note, uh, during World War II, members of the Dreyfus family, who had fought for France so often and so patriotically, were, like all French Jews, forced into hiding. Alfred's favorite granddaughter, Madeleine, a resistance fighter, was deported by the Vichy state and died in Auschwitz at the age of 25. 
So this brings us to the early 20th century. And I'm sure this is something you're all familiar with. Uh, so let's go into a little depth on what this Protocols of the Elders of Zion actually was. In 1903, a Russian newspaper secured an exclusive serial of what they called of great importance. It revealed a terrible conspiracy for world domination from a group responsible for some troubling recent events, the Jews. Purporting to be the minutes from a meeting of Jewish leaders, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion revealed that the Jews planned to take over the world through manipulating the economy and media and starting religious conflicts. We know that the so-called Elders of Zion never even existed. So where did the Protocols come from? In 1864, a French satirist named Maurice Jolet wrote The Dialogue in Hell between Machiavelli and Montesquieu. Now, Jolet never even mentions Jews in his book, but a lot of the protocols took ideas from it. About 20 years later, a Prussian writer, Hermann Goetz, wrote a novel titled Biarritz. It also contains ideas that were incorporated and flat lifted from it into the protocols. Now, while they know the Protocols was a total fraud, plenty of people believed its authenticity. The pamphlets spread throughout Europe after the Russian Revolution in 1917 with anti-Bolshevik immigrants. Many white Russians, as they came to be called, blamed the fall of the Tsar on Jews. So in 1920, Henry Ford's newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, ran a series of articles based on the Protocols, earning praise from Adolf Hitler himself. The historian Norman Kohn writes about the impact of the protocols and its influence on Nazism. And this is a quote from Dr. Kohn. The Volkischer Beobachter, which was the official Nazi newspaper of the Third Reich, invoked them constantly. While Julius Stryker's weekly Sturmer, which was a bi-weekly tabloid type newspaper, alternated between elaborations of the protocols and lurid stories of German maidens raped by Jews and German children ritually murdered. So today we call the protocols a lie that won't die. And if you Google it, you will find literally thousands of sites devoted to it. Some debunking it, some swearing is all based on the truth. So anti-Semitism in Russia was at a fever pitch after the publication of the protocols. And when Tsar Nicholas II was toppled by communist revolutionaries in 1917, the blame fell squarely on those, quote, Jewish authors, end quote, of the conspiracy for world domination. That didn't help that many of the Bolshevik leaders were Jewish, including the leader of the Red Army, Leon Trotsky, whose real name, by the way, was Lev Davidovich Bronstein. So though Bolshevik ideology was militantly atheist and anti-religion, the racial signs of the preceding century seemed to prove to their opponents that these men were evil agitators because of their race. Thus, an anti-Semitic storm was further whipped up with appalling consequences. The Bolshevik regime had to defend itself against the white army who fought to reinstate old, the old Tsarist regime between 1917 and 1921. Whenever possible, the white army focused its campaign of terror and violence upon Jews because they were, again, blamed for the Russian Revolution. Under the leadership of Anton Denikin, the white army massacred between 100 and 150,000 Jews across southern Russia and Ukraine in just four years. Many Jews chose to flee Russia altogether and resettle in safer surroundings in Europe and the United States. So I want to show you a couple of propaganda posters. They're both from the white Russian point of view. The first one depicts Leon Trotsky in connection with the old blood libel myth, which you will recall from last week's program, is an accusation from the Middle Ages against Jews murdering Christian children for ritual purposes. This poster is titled Sacrifice to the Internationale, and it shows Trotsky killing a girl at an altar to Karl Marx, surrounded by other Bolsheviks. And if you know the leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution, that's Lenin in the red, and behind him, standing over him with his arms raised, are, is Alexander Kerensky. And the others are pretty recognizable if you're familiar with them. Uh, I want you to notice, too, a couple of things. In the left foreground, 
there are some Chinese soldiers, what the white Russians refer to as the Orientals. Um, and also there's a, a real stereotypical picture of a Jew in the center holding a bag. I don't know what's in the bag, so if you do know what that is supposed to represent, please email me because I'd like to know. So the message is clear from this poster. Um, you know, what's going on here? They're blaming the Jews and the so-called Orientals for the entire revolution. Now this next one is even more disturbing. This is a poster showing Leo Trotsky, and he's, he's depicted as this devilish, hook-nosed ogre with a large gold pentagram swinging across his chest, blood dripping down the walls of the Kremlin. Looks like he's hoarding this pile of skulls that are being guarded by his Chinese troops. Now again, the message is clear. Bolshevism is an alien force being imposed on Russia by Jews and these Orientals, and it will bring, bring death and destruction due to the greed of these outsiders. The caption here reads, peace and liberty in Soviet Russia. And also please note, there's a, a guy dressed all in white, so I'm guessing he's depicting a white Russian being tied, he's tied up and a Chinese army person is holding a gun to his head, about ready to execute him. So we're gonna to end today with a book I know you're all familiar with, Mein Kampf, which translates to My Struggle. And it was published in 1925, written of course by Hitler. Uh, now the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum describes it as part autobiography and part political treatise. Mein Kampf promoted the key components of Nazism, rabid anti-Semitism, a racist worldview, and an aggressive foreign policy geared to, late, to gaining Lebensraum, or living space, in Eastern Europe. Now, according to Hitler, it was the sacred, sacred mission of the German people to assemble and preserve the most valuable racial elements and raise them to the dominant position. And I'm gonna quote here directly from Mein Kampf. All who are not of a good race are chaff. It was necessary for Germans to occupy themselves not merely with the breeding of dogs, horses, and cats, but also with the care for the purity of their own blood. That's it, and I'll end quote there. Uh, Hitler ascribed international significance to the elimination of Jews, the elimination of Jews, which, and I quote again, must necessarily be a bloody process, end quote. So this book was sold and distributed throughout Germany. Through aggressive marketing, the publisher pressured the public, German institutions, and Nazi organizations to purchase copies. Buying it was viewed as a patriotic act, even if you never cracked the cover. Nearly what couples received a copy, a copy as a wedding gift from the state. Soldiers were given backpack editions upon enlistment. Virtually every household in Germany had at least one copy. And by the end of 1944, more than 12 million copies had been printed, most of them after 1939. So in this image, you see one of those wedding presentation volumes with a picture of the couple on the, other side, on the, on the fly. Now, mein, Kampf, mein Kampf was a clear-cut warning to the world of Hitler's intentions for war and genocide, which may have been recognized and prevented had more people read it outside of Germany. Since the war, the book has remained a flashpoint of controversy, especially in Germany and the former, former Axis nations. At the end of the war, worried about its use as propaganda by neo-Nazi groups, Germany and Austria banned the possession and selling of Mein Kampf outright, while some countries restricted its possession to people using the book for academic purposes only. Opponents of the ban argued that the book was a valuable historical document that kept and that keeping it unavailable only made it more desirable to white to right wing groups. Now this became a moot point because in 2015, copyright for Mein Kampf expired, ending the Bavarian government's official control over the book. You can currently buy it on Barnes and Noble's website or Apple Books. Now, interesting to note, Amazon re removed it from sale in March of 2020 but you don't actually have to even buy it. It's widely available online as a downloadable PDF or from Project Gutenberg. So now that brings us to an end of today's program. Again, thank you for watching. And as ever, if you have questions about today's presentation or would like to suggest future topics, please email me at patriceweaver 
at holocaust.georgia.gov. We are constantly looking to improve our presentations and I welcome your feedback. Thank you very much.